So everyone, welcome. Today we have Scott White, who is the chairman of a real estate company based out of uh, New York, New Jersey area, and also the guy who is the life is too short guy. And so Scott, thank you so much for coming and visiting with us today. My pleasure. Thanks for inviting me, Jerry. Absolutely. So Scott, tell me a little bit about how you came up with the concept of life is too short guy. So I think it evolved over the course of my life. It's, it's, it's my own philosophy on living in life, but I, I didn't define it or clearly sort of put a pin on it until I'd say probably the last 18 months or so, where it really became a reality to me was, was during COVID, where I think a lot of people had those major aha moments, those epiphanies. Mm -hmm. I was working with an executive coach by the name of Kevin, who was Fantastic. And and so some of the preliminary work with Kevin where he gets to know me, I get to know him, and, and we sort of break down what we want to accomplish in terms of the executive co executive coaching, the goals. He, he says to me in a conversation, he's just sort of, you know, uh, unexpectedly, he's like, dude, you're like Mr. Life is too short guy. And I'm like, yeah, I think that's right. I think that that's a lot of who I am and what I think about and how I, but, you know, I'm not sure I responded directly that way, but I was like, yeah, that's kind of cool. I am Mr. Life is too short guy. And you know, then that night I went, I, I was talking to my wife and I was like, yeah, you know, I had this great session with Kevin, a new executive coach I'm working with, great guy. I think we're going to accomplish a lot. And it, it's funny, he branded me Mr. Life is Too Short Guy. And she's like, yeah, I could totally see that. And, uh, you know, you've been talking and I, there was probably a conversation in there that, that I'm forgetting a couple of sentences of, but you've been talking about writing a book for years. Maybe that's your concept. And I'm like, mm. what, what's my concept? She's like, Mr. Life is Too Short Guy. And like, you know, like a lot of things my wife says to me, it's sort of, you know, it goes in, it percolates. Initially, I'm like, man, I have no idea what you're talking about. And then eventually I'm like, oh, she's brilliant. So probably, oh, I don't know. I, I mulled it over for a couple of days. I'm like, huh, this is kind of cool. Maybe Mr. Life is Too Short Guy is, is an interesting concept. And this was probably Jan, February of, of last year, of 2021. And I sat down and I was all excited. In fact, it was February. I remember exactly when it was late February. I sat down and I started writing an outline. I'm like, so what is Mr. Life is Too Short Guy? What's what's my philosophy? How do I live? What's important to me? And I made a few notes. And I went back a couple of days later and I made a few more notes. And, you know, I, I like to run a lot. I went out and I was running and I came back and I'm, I, I write down a few more notes. And before you know it, I got pages of notes. And uh, by the way, it died. I did that for about six weeks. And I'm like, all right, well, great. Now I got, I don't know, a dozen pages of notes on what Mr. Life is Too Short guy is, and I don't know what I'm going to do with this. And I, I I put it away. And and I actually didn't think much about it. I'd like to tell you that I've been percolating this for years. It sort of went on the shelf through much of 2021. And then earlier this year, you know, like everyone, you get to the beginning of the year, you're like, you know, what do you want to get done this year? What do you want to accomplish? And and on my my long list of all the things that I wanted to do was, was someday I want to write a book. There wasn't a this year kind of concept, but Someday I really want to write a book. I enjoy writing. I, I want to share my thoughts, my philosophies. You know, maybe this is the year. And then, you know, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. By, by sheer luck, I, I see a webinar. And there's, there's a, a gentleman by the name of Eric Koster. And Eric is a professor at Georgetown who, it's a longer story, but he basically has been teaching a course on writing a book at Georgetown University in the MBA program for years. And they opened it up externally to, to non-Georgetown students. And, and I did a call with Eric and he's, he's you know, truly amazing, high energy. I'm super high energy, but he, he is he is high energy. And I'm like, look, I'm, I want to write a book. And, you know, I don't know, I'm thinking about something maybe in, in building a culture. I've written a couple of things on that and, and I run a public company. So, and then I also get this concept Life is too short, guy. Like live in the moment, gratefulness, happiness, make the most of it, high energy. Today's your day. You only have so many minutes. He's like, that's your book. And I'm like, what's my book? Like I, 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 I got this outline, but I'm not sure what he's like, just start and it'll come to you. And they ran an amazing program that, that walked me through over the last kind of six months on, on the book process. I submitted my manuscript to my second editor a couple of days ago. So it is now going through another version of edits and I will work with a few more edits the rest of this year. And it is my goal, expectation, hope to have, I eliminated the mister, by the way, because the title was just starting to get ridiculous. Life is too short guy, making every day the best day ever. It'll be out in January and I'm really fired up about it. I'm excited. I think it's a philosophy I've had my whole life, but had you and I met 18 months ago and you're like, so, so tell me what it is. I would have just been like, rambling about meaningless stuff. Now I, I've really thought about, you know, where did I come up with this? Why? What's important to me? What are the foundational elements? What are some examples, stories, so on and so forth? And, and that, that's the book. The book is, it lays out, 
you know, living in the moment, why can't today be the best day of your life? And I mean that sincerely, not a passing sort of baloney, like, ah, whatever, this nut, uh, best day of his life, move on. Like, why can't it be? Why can't you wake up in the morning and be like, you know what? I'm going to make today the best day of my life. And how do I do that? And, and, and it's really designed to be a very approachable, practical, non-academic, non-elitist type book. Like there's a lot of those wonderful books and I've read some and I could recommend some, but I want everyone to read this. Like people have asked me, so, so who's your target audience? And my answer literally is anyone, anyone that can read can wake up and smile and be happy. And the what better goal, vision, whatever mission than to try to make the world happier one smile at a time. And that that's sort of the story. That's the, the quick, although it took me probably three minutes to explain, but the quick kind of where did life is too short guy come from? I love it. I love it. And Alex Sanfilippo, who uh, joined us, said, congrats, because I think it's an amazing task to set out and say, here's the gift that I'm supposed to give to the world. And here's the message that I'm going to go give to people. And so I think, by the way, I think your wife and my wife might be related because I just automatically assume she's right when she gives me ideas. And so anything good that I come up with, I just immediately give Rachel credit for. And so I'm doing that publicly again now. Well done. Well um, played. That all, all good things that have ever happened or that I've thought about, it's actually all Rachel's ideas and thoughts. So I think they're related. No so question. walk us through... Because, you know, here's one of the things I get to work with high achievers, people just like you, right? Chairman of the board. And so people who are high achievers take, do, take action differently. They don't think about like, could have been, should have been, would have been. They go do it. And I think that's part of the philosophy that's in life is too short, that we're going to push procrastination away. We're going to take action differently. And so Part of what you said is the book is going to be approachable. There's frameworks inside of it to help people do that. Can you walk us through some of the ideas that are inside the book for people who do have those moments of self-doubt, that imposter syndrome, all of those things that I think at some point in time, if you're a human being, you have suffered. No question. But un unpack for us the practical implications of life is too short, guy. So I think a big part of what I want people to think about is you only have so many minutes in your life. And I actually talk about this in the book and, and uh, bring out my, my in-depth mastery of mathematics, which is pretty simple. I say, you know, plus or minus somebody born in the United States and, I, and there's lots of sort of different numbers, but plus or minus people live to about 80. You know, people born today, by the way, are going to live considerably longer, but my guess is my audience is somewhere between 30 and 70 plus or minus. So people are going to live to about 80. So when you take 80 years of life and you multiply it by the number of days, by the number of minutes, so on and so forth, you have 42 million minutes in your life, 42 million minutes. And you're like, all right, well, great. I got 42 million. So what's a few here? What's a few there? Well, uh, as I look around the call, the people that have joined this call, and I suspect those of your listeners, a lot of us are kind of halfway there. Maybe, maybe in the back half, right? So, so take that 42. And again, I'm going to show you my, my in-depth mathematics skills and cut it in half. So now all of a sudden you're down to 21 million minutes, okay? And now plus or minus, we all sleep about eight hours a night. I know a couple people listening are like, I don't know who this dude is sleeping eight hours a night. If I'm lucky, I get five hours of sleep. But, you know, I'm, I'm going to keep the math simple for my purposes. So let's just say you sleep about eight hours a day, which I do think is healthy. So now about a third of those 21 minutes are gone. So now you're down to 14 million minutes left in your life. And by the way, I'm assuming you're about 40. So anyone that's older than that, you're going to have to do some, some additional math that I'm not going to do. But so now you have 14 million minutes in your life. And what I, what I want people to really think about, and I think about all the time, is how are you spending them? Like, honestly, is this a good use of your time? You're sitting on this call right now. And I think about that. Like, I'm honored, truly honored. And I mean that to, to be invited on this call. I mean, I, I've been so impressed by everything you've done, Jerry, and, and your following and and you know, all the interactions we've had. So I'm like, wow, you know what? This is a great use of, for me, about 75 minutes. And I think about the world that way. And, and by the way, every minute doesn't have to be saving the world. It doesn't have to be advancing your business. It doesn't have to be exercising. It could be whatever you choose. In fact, I don't make judgments. You may say, you know what? The most important thing to me for the next 60 minutes is to watch TV. Awesome. What I'm asking you to do is think about, are you really processing how you're using the minutes? Instead of when you get to the end of the day, the end of the week, the end of the month, if you're like, I don't know what the hell I did or where time went, then I actually don't think you're being proactive. I don't think you're using your minutes wisely. It's a choice. It's a choice. You may say, for me, reading uh, a novel is what I want to do. 
But there's a trade-off there. Reading that novel means you can't spend that time with maybe a loved one. You may say, I want to spend time with my family. That's fine. There's a trade-off there. Maybe you can't exercise today. You may say, I want to exercise today. Fine. That's a trade-off. Maybe you can't put in as much time at work. These are all trade-offs that I'm not going to attempt to, to tell you what's important to you. You need to figure that out. What I want to tell people, what I think a compelling message is, is be deliberate, be proactive, be thoughtful, make sure you're using those minutes wisely. And if you're not, then, then, then get off the call. Like, I hate to say that because I don't want, oh, hopefully no one dropped off. No, we didn't lose anybody. But, but, but if, if you're sitting here and you're like, yeah, I, this is not a great use of my time. I could use it more wisely. That's what I want people to think about. And there's so many more sort of permutations of that in terms of, of, you know, as, as I dig into sort of how you use your time, what about goals? How often do people set goals? And I mean, really set goals, like write down those goals. In the book, I talk about creating a goals grid and everyone does it differently. My method isn't necessarily the best method, but I talk about how on my grid, I create sort of across the top. For me, I have a couple of main buckets. For me, there's, there's business goals, there's family goals, there's physical goals. Exercise is pretty important to me. And then there's personal goals that are sort of beyond that. And then I have different time frames. I'm like, all right, so, and it depends on, on what the goal is, but you know, today's goals, this month's goals, this year's goals and future goals. And I have them all laid out. And by the way, I don't accomplish all of them, but if I don't start with a roadmap, then again, you're getting back to a perfect example, by the way, is the book. As, as we led into this, I wanted to write a book for many years, but it was never an important goal to me. It was always on the long-term goals until it started to move up. And then I was proactive and thoughtful. And how am I going to make this happen? So I want people to, to realize, and I call it positive urgency, that we should be urgent in terms of what we do with our lives, how we use our minutes, and make sure we're proud of what we're doing, make sure we're excited you know, another big concept that we talk about is, is, is being excited, being energized. Like, are you having a wonderful day? Are you having the best day ever? If not, what's bringing you down? And can you eliminate that? And can you incorporate more things into your life that'll be wonderful, that'll be amazing, that'll make you smile, that'll make you happy? Now, look, I'm realistic. And, and, and if I didn't say things like this, you really should question my credibility. Not everything is perfect, right? I don't have a perfect life. No one has a perfect life. Not every minute of every day is absolutely awesome. But I think too often we as, as humans, we as a society aren't deliberate, aren't proactive, aren't thoughtful in making the use of best use of our minutes in being excited and being happy. And we get, we sort of get on the proverbial treadmill and we sort of go through the motions of, yeah, you know, this job is, it's a job, you know, it pays the bills. That's wrong. That's horrible. That that's a miserable way to live. And that's why for me, so much, there's so much negativity in the world. And I talk about that too. You know, part of what motivated me to write this and part of the mission I'm on right now is let's stop with the negativity, throw me all the bad things that are going on. And I'll tell you why all those are amazing. Right. I mean, it, it's, there what's, is, an, what's an example of that, Scott, of, of all the bad things. Well, you said, give, give me a bad thing that's happening in the world and I'll give you the good thing. So, so there, there are so many of those. So let me start with all the bad things, right? Everyone's, let, let, let's start with the easiest one, right? So, so we're coming right out of COVID like, oh my God, this was, was horrible. And, and by the way, it was horrible. There's no doubt about it. But what came good of it? Well, for me, I got so much more family time. For so many people, it was a major aha moment where they didn't go back to the same job. They didn't go back to the same routine. They took on new hobbies. They got involved in new things. So while the world is focused on how bad COVID was and, and how many deaths there were, which is horrible. Again, I can't sort of, I can't credibly say, wow, well, whatever, we lost X number, 100 million people, and, but, but look at how great it is. Like That would be ridiculous. What I'm saying is instead of focusing on all the negativity, Look at all the positivity that comes out of it. Look at, at opportunities to sort of spin things and look at them differently. And I talk, you know, I'll give you a, another great example. I talk in the book and one of the major aha moments in, in my life was the death of both of my parents. I lost both of my parents at, at, at younger ages, not very young. My, my dad was 65, my mom was 70. And at the funeral, I gave the eulogy and I talked about being grateful and happy. How many eulogies have you heard where people are grateful and happy? I'm like, I'm grateful you're all here. I'm grateful that I had my dad as long as I did. I'm grateful that my dad had a heart attack 23 years ago and he still got to see me get married, have children, go through all these things. I'm happy that he got to know my children. So again, there's a wonderful example of, I can't think of almost a worse day of, of someone's life than, than being at the funeral of, of a loved one. And I found a way to be grateful and happy at that. Yeah, I want to rewind a little bit. Because I think it's an important distinction. I, and I talk to 
some of my CEOs about this. We look at money and we budget for money. We have budgets inside of our, our companies. We have personal budgets and we're intentional about how we spend our money because it's a finite resource. And yet with time, we're constantly just allowing time to slip away. And so if we treated time like we did money, you would change the dynamic of achieving the things that you want to get done again and again and again. I've never done it in minutes. I've always done it in there's 168 hours in a week. And you know, if you're gonna sleep seven hours, that's what I go, uh, go after it's 49. And you start to break down lunches behind that and dinners. And you know, at the end of it, it's like, okay, how much time am I actually spending on the things and the pursuits that I wanna go take? And so it's just an analogy that I've used with, with people to get them to go like, oh, that's right. I do, when I go to the grocery store, I can't spend $107 if I only have a hundred. Right. And so getting people into that mindset of using time as a tool, just like we use finances to create freedom for fulfillment, right? Same thing with time. We should be aligned and intentional. To your point, we talk about conscious intention. Bill's gone through the leadership gap course. And we talk a lot about how do we show up as an intentional leader, right? A predictable, intentional leader. And I think the highest purpose of life for anyone, whether you're a leader, whether you're a CEO, is your life on your terms creates that piece of fulfillment. And I think that's what you're trying to, to get people, you know, rattle the cage on. Don't just let the 41 million minutes walk themselves out of your life. It's what are we doing with those minutes to create that unlock for you to be successful? Agreed. And, and I think the only thing I might change, and that, that's a wonderful analogy, but I'm less focused on success for me, happiness is success. So, so everyone defines success differently. And one of the things that I'm very deliberate about here is, is success may very well be raising a family, may very well be being there in the final years when a loved one was around, it may very well be studying some area of interest without necessarily a, a particular degree or, or a, you know, I think we as a society have these certain built-in, you know, success is a, a, an MBA, a PhD, success is making it to the top of a company, success is, you know, keep filling in the blank. For me, one of the fundamental tenets of the, of the book and of the philosophy is just be happy every day. I want to make the world a happier place. It's one of those things that, that I've thought about and I challenge everyone on the phone. Like, how would you disagree with that? Almost anyone else you've had on over the last however long you've been doing this, there's probably two sides to it, right? Someone's going to talk about this particular management technique or someone's going to talk about this budgeting technique. Goes, eh, that, that's a good idea, but, but you know, here's a different way to do it. How could you argue with making the world happier? How can you argue with living a, a happier, more fulfilling, grateful life? To me, it's, it's, it's so simple and that's part of it. You know, one of the things that I suspect is, is when people listen to this and they hang up, they're going to be like, you know, it was kind of simple. I'm not sure that, that there was some big major like, oh, well, well, that's the, the, the point, the, to me, the point is that it is so simple that it is sort of so practical, but we don't do it. You know, one of the things I think about is, is that th there's so much energy and focus on physical health, right? We go for annual physical exams. We exercise, we, we think about what we eat. How often do people think about their mental health? How often do people, and, and by the way, I want to be very careful here. I'm not a mental health practitioner. I'm, I'm not providing mental health advice, but how often are we proactive in thinking about, well, what's going to make me happy? What's going to make me fulfilled? What's going to make me feel good? It's great that, that I went and I lifted weights and my muscles are big and strong and so on and so forth. But if I'm miserable here, who cares? I'd much rather, and I bet you almost everyone on the call would much rather be happier here and weaker here. But we as a society don't spend a lot of time on that. That's part of my mission and part of what I'm trying to accomplish. Or you can be like Alex and be super strong physically and super amazing mentally too. It's, you know, some of us get it all, right, Alex? <laughs> I think, I think when you, when you break it down, right, I think coming back to it, one of the things that I see, and it's what you're speaking directly to, which is, do you have a vision or a mission that you're on, the impact that you want to go make? And do you have values, your operating system by which you're going to you know, make your decisions, take your actions so that you can feel good about them. And I think where people go wrong with this is 
they start blowing like a leaf in the wind because they've never decided for themselves, this is the impact that I want to go make on life. And so they blow around and they're like, eh, I don't know. I just don't feel fulfilled. I don't feel happy about what it is that I'm doing. And it's like, well, like, what do you want to go do? And they're like, eh, I don't know. I'm not sure. And so do you have any of that in the book where it's, it's actually defining hey, here's what you have to do because the only way that you can align your actions with your vision, your values to unlock that happiness or fulfillment uh, is defining it. Do, do you speak to that at all? I mean, you're speaking to it here, but I don't know if it's in the book. Yeah, look, there's, there's no question. And in fact, in the book, there's there's a lot of very specific sort of, I, I call them the perfect 10. So, so it's nice to get on a call like this, which I'm really enjoying, by the way, and talk about everybody, be happy and set goals. But but what's actionable? Like when, when we end the call, what are the takeaway items? What are people going to focus on? And, and I call them sort of the, the perfect 10. And I give examples of, of where I do this. And then even more interesting, I bring in examples of other people that have, have had major aha moments in their life. And, and I think that's a powerful concept because too often we, we wait for that proverbial kick in the teeth. And one of the things that I'm trying to accomplish in this book is to tell the stories of ordinary people, by the way, that have had that kick in the teeth. And I want the reader to take away and be like, huh, do I really have to wait? You know, in the book, I talked to someone who uh, had a major catastrophic injury, a football player paralyzed from the neck down. And, and he goes on, his name is Eric Legrand, by the way, for those that, that know mm -hmm. the story, he goes on to, to build a very successful career. He recently launched a, a coffee house business and his own branded coffee. He's a, a sports broadcaster on ESPN, on Sirius XM, so on and so forth. He's written a book. He's done so many amazing things. And I tell his story. Then I have stories of a woman that overcame breast cancer and she started her own company, started her own business, something that sort of before was, was not prepared to, to do. I have another woman in the book who had a brain cancer, who had brain cancer, who also then went out on her own and, and was a consultant before that, talked about fear and risk. And then afterwards is like, wait a sec, I just survived brain cancer. What, what, how bad could it be? What happens if the business doesn't work? Like on a relative basis. So, so there's a lot of those stories, but let me get back Jerry, because I'm, I'm, I guess, deviating a little bit. So, so what are kind of the actionable items? What, what can readers and listeners think about? So I talk about 10 important concepts that I'll just, I'll gloss over. There's a lot more in the book. One, and, and I think it's really the most important one is attitude is everything. I, I really think people underestimate their ability to control their attitude, to control sort of where everything is going. And I talk about the power of positivity, the power of of, of gratefulness, the power of, and, and there are a number of studies mentioned in there. In fact, I'll, I'll mention one in particular, a, a wonderful author, scholar, Sean Acor, who wrote The Happiness Advantage, who, who talks about how 90%, 90%, I mean, this is just amazing, of happiness is not predicted by the outside world and what's around you, but how your brain processes the world. 25% of job success is predicted by IQ, 75% by optimism, social support, and the ability to handle stress. I mean, th these are powerful concepts in terms of what can you do in terms of your attitude, your happiness, your gratefulness. A related concept, the second one is, is choose your attitude, own it, set the tone, not only with yourself, but how you interact with people. You know, think about, and, and I tell uh, uh, some interesting stories in here. How often do you interact with, with other people on a daily basis, a, a, your mailman, your, the crossing guard, the, the customer service rep? Let me tell you a, a quick story about customer service rep and what I mean by this. How often have you called? There's actually a story, I think, in the journal today, if I'm not mistaken, about how horrible airline customer service is right now. And they, they quote sort of American United, long wait, unhappy people. So how often have, have you called a customer service rep and, and it starts with, you know, thanks for reaching, I'll, I'll just use United, how can it be helpful? And you jump into, well, you know, I, I got to switch my flight from Atlanta to Denver is, isn't going to work. I got a different flight. Well, what if you changed the tone of the conversation? And it's, and this happened to me recently. This is, it's the story I tell in the book of, Hey, good afternoon, United. How can I be helpful? Um, hi, this is Scott. Who am I speaking to? Oh, you're, you're speaking to, I'll just, uh, I'll pick, you know, I forget the, the woman's name. It doesn't matter. Stephanie. Hi, Stephanie. How are you? I, I'm wonderful. How are you? Great. How can I be helpful? Well, yeah, you know, I'm having some issues with some flights. I'd like to talk to you about, 
boy, it's, it's, it's been a, a, a rough go with, with you guys changing some flights and things moving around and, and me trying to figure out my schedule. And then she responds, yeah, you know, we've, we've canceled this. We've, th- there's been some issues so on and so forth. Anyway, I don't have to go into all the details, but I could tell you from this call, I learned that, that Stephanie lived in Chicago. She had three children. One child graduated with a degree in psychology. She's worried about her son who isn't great with money. By the way, she gets that. He gets that from her father who now is living alone. She lost her mother recently. Anyway, I can go on. I can tell you so much more. The point of this is you have the opportunity to set the tone with people you interact with. Why not create a positive environment both for you and that person? How happy was Stephanie that somebody actually cared who she was as a person, as opposed to my flight from Denver to Atlanta got screwed up and it's your fault. Fix it, right? How many times does she take that call? That's just one example, but you could parlay that into what do you do when you interact with, how about the last time you went to, to you dealt with a salesperson, wherever it was, it doesn't really matter. They approach you and you, you got your guard up. Oh boy, what, is, what does this person want from me? As opposed to get to know that person. So so I talk about, and I think choosing your attitude is really important as a second concept. A third I, concept. I, 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 think, I think you're right. I'm just going to give you a breath there for half a second because you have two, once two I, of my- Once I get going, I get excited. I know. I can, I can feel it, brother. It's rolling. It's rolling. But- I think about choose your attitude. So every morning I get a text message from my assistant and it has something about having a great day and how lucky we are to go make this impact, right? And so that's how I start my day every day because I get up early and Maria sends me that never, never a doubt. It always comes in right around six o'clock. And so you think about that and you set the tone for not only your own day, but all the people around you. And so you know, I think the, the whole point is a, a negative attitude is contagious and good news. So is a positive one. And so when Zach is going in for his call point, I, I'm sure they're excited to see him because the attitude is positive, right? It's like, all right, Zach's here. What are we going to talk about? We're probably going to talk about drugs, I think. I'm not sure, but that's probably what we're going to talk about. And I think you're, I think you're right. Like w- when I think about <clears throat> the nine principles of personal performance, which is the book that I am trying to write. I promise, Rachel, it will eventually come out of me. But attitude is everything. And I say, you know, you can't always choose your circumstance, but you can always choose your attitude and your approach. That is always an internal locus of control. So I may not be happy that it's raining out today and that I want to go fishing, but man, I can be optimistic that I'm going to go catch a big fish. And so it all lives in here. And I think you know, one of the things that I, I've been talking about recently is I get to work with high achievers. And the difference between high achievers and the highest achievers, it's all about your mindset, your ability to get yourself back to center and to be able to, hey, we're all going to have ups and downs and wiggles in our mindset, but being able to get ourselves back to center and to keep that positive mindset makes all the difference in the world to align your actions to your vision and your values to go make the impact. And so I love where you're headed. Number three, Scott. Well, first of all, before I get to number three, I love that Maria sends you a, uh, a text every morning like that. If every morning. Careful, I'm going to poach Maria away. Uh, <laughs> now, look, I think that's great. And one of the things I actually mentioned in terms of, because I want there to be real actionable things in the book. So here's a simple one. Think about your first thought of the day. How often do you think about that? If I ask you right now, what was your first thought of the day? And it sounds like you're pretty proactive about this. So I suspect you'll have an answer. But, but what is that first thought of your day every day? You have the ability to control what that first thought is. What was it today? How do I make my wife happier? There you go. How do I protect my kids? And how do I serve my people? It is the first thought that I think about every single day. So, so I will tell you, mine is different every day, and it's it's based on the circumstances. But it's really about waking up with a with a smile and happiness. And and I like to proclaim it out loud too. I think that's important. So so you'll often hear me say, not just in my house, but the people I talk to in the you know Happy Monday, happy you know some some stranger days that people are like, huh, like. Happy Groundhog Day. Okay, happy Groundhog Day to you too. But but there's no reason why every day can't be a happy day. And, and waking up with that sort of first thought, I, I talk about having a clear lens because I think if, if you muddy the lens early and you wake up with a, oh, geez, I got to do this 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 call with Jerry today. Ugh, I hope it goes well. Right? I mean, then you can't clear it as opposed to waking up with, wow, 
I can't believe Jerry actually invited me as a guest on this show. This is going to be amazing. I'm energized about what I'm doing. I can't wait to tell him. Let me get over real quickly to my computer and fire out on my social media and let people know I'm doing it. And that actually is how I woke up today. In all seriousness, it was it was early. I woke up very early. I love the extended daylight this time of year. And uh, I went out and rode my bike with some friends real early. It was out by 6 a.m. But before that, I was like, all right. So I got to make sure I'm ready for, for Jerry's show because this is a big day for me and a great opportunity. And and I can't say never, but almost never will I wake up and my first thought will be negative. I'm very deliberate and proactive, which I think is important, waking up with, wow, here are the amazing things I get to do today. I can't believe it. It's almost like a, you know, pinch me. Wow. Am I going to get to be on this call? Am I going to get to, you know, I rode a bike this morning with three or four great friends who, by the way, crushed me. I, I felt like I chased them for 25 miles, but I am grateful to have those experiences. And that's how I wake up. So, so those are the first two. The third one is little things make a big difference. And there's small things that you can do in, in your life to, to, to enjoy life more. So what do you mean by that? Give me some real examples, Scott. So, so symbolism. The, the, and in fact, I did not do this for purposes of the call. I swear to you, but I don't know if you could see this, but eh, eh, probably not eh, no. the background. Anyway, that, uh, the, the mug says, be happy. Why not? Why not have small symbols in your life? It actually matters. Look, I don't need a mug to tell me to be happy. I'm the happiest guy you're going to talk to. But, but why not, as we walk around, have small symbols, things to, to remind us of gratefulness and happiness. I'm going to tell you, and I tell the story in the book, so I'm giving it away here, but, but it's actually very timely in terms of symbolism, both symbolism and celebration. I think celebration is really important. I think we should celebrate more often than we do. So this week, two days ago, my wife and I have been dating, but I mean, we're married 25 years, but we went on our first date 33 years ago this past week. and. Hold on, I got to interrupt. I have to interrupt. I can't believe you still, A, have the same shirt that you wore on your first You saw day. the story. There it is. And and B, that it still fits you. It, so, there's the story. It, it looks like a brand new shirt. I mean, if I wore the same well, it only shirt comes out that once I wore- a year. It only with, comes out when, once a year. With, with, if I wore the same shirt that, that I wore when I met Rachel, I'd probably look like Alex's shirt, like real tight and just, I mean, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that it would work. It's not a bad look, by the way. I mean, that, that's not a bad look. Alex does look like a strong guy. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's a great example of, of symbolism and celebration. As Jerry said, I, I very carefully selected a, 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 a T-shirt. I mean, I was 16 years old for my first date. And Jen, my wife and I have been together now 33 years. And every year on the anniversary of our, or 32 years, I'm sorry, uh, on the anniversary of, of our first date, I put the shirt on. And why do I do it? This gets back to little things make a big difference. It's an opportunity to smile, to remember, to be grateful, to, to the symbolism of, you know, we're here again, 32 years later, I have a wonderful marriage, a wonderful family. Why not? It gets back to the mug. What about just smiling? How often do you proactively think about smiling? I love that Jerry's smiling right now. I look around the call. I don't see a ton of smiles. It doesn't hurt the smile. And smiling is free. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt. It feels good. And I talk a little bit about some of the science. And again, I'm really careful not to get into a lot of the science and stats. I, I provide some because I think there's a credibility in terms of, all right, this guy's spewing a bunch of stuff. I hope he can back it up. But but I did not write the book and, and very deliberately as an academic piece. There's a lot of wonderful stuff out there. But quite frankly, I, I think a lot of people find that boring. This is more about stories and anecdotes and, and actionable items. But there is a lot of data on the power of smiling, how it impacts your brain, how it impacts those around you. So symbolism. The power of smiling, celebrating, music, whistling. How often do you walk around whistling? I, I actually drive some people nuts because I'll just be walking. I don't even whistle anything, but it, it, there's small things that, that make me happy, make others happy. When was the last time you heard, I mean, I could probably think of one or two examples, but you heard somebody whistling and you're like, oh man, that's annoying. That's horrible. That, that's miserable. That's like, whistling doesn't depress people. It makes people happy. So, so the third concept is, is, Little things make a big difference. And I tell a bunch of stories in there, both personally and of others. The fourth concept is funny things are everywhere. Find humor, mm. laugh at, at the world around you, laugh at yourself. Too many people take themselves too seriously. And, and you know, I, I'm actually exactly the opposite. I don't take myself seriously at all. And, and I take very little seriously because they're, look, there are certain situations in life where it's a serious moment, but there aren't many of them. 
And, and in fact, I, I won't give it away. You'll have to read the book, but I tell a story about, you know, again, I, I hate to go back to it, but I do a number of times the book because it was very influential on me and on my philosophy. But, you know, my, my father passed away now 17 years ago, I think. And, you know, when, when I was by his casket, my phone rang and, and, you know, I answered it and, and made a joke of it. You know, you want to talk about the, the, the last place in the world that you think something's funny. I'm like, enjoy, smile, be happy, find humor everywhere. So that, that's sort of the, the fourth concept. Your, da- your dad's, your, your dad still was going to be dead. And that's exactly still right. Were gonna be at his funeral. That's exactly right. So, so using humor made me feel better, made other people feel better. It levels the playing field. You know, I think humor is a way of, there are times that you'll meet someone that is either, and I, I say quote unquote, and I mean this, like you feel like you're inferior to that person. You feel like you're superior to that person. Maybe this person works for you. Maybe you work for somebody. Maybe, you know, maybe it's a, an elder grandfather and a young child, but humor is a common language. Humor breaks down barriers. And I'm not suggesting that everyone finds this thing, things funny because we don't, that it's very personal in particular, but generally not taking the situation yourself too seriously breaks down barriers, makes people more approachable, makes people more comfortable, regardless of the situation. Again, I tell other stories that, that relate more to business where I've been in tense litigation matters, negotiations, and, and, you know, large hundred million dollar plus transactions where people are getting worked up and I'll just be, I'll, I'll make a joke of it. And people are like, what? Like, seriously? And then all of a sudden everyone's like, Hey, you know, it brings everything down a level and it brings down the, the, the air, the mystery of, of, you know, this important, that support. You know what? Again, getting back to the book, life is too short. Get over it. Enjoy, smile, find humor. So that, that's, that's the next uh, fourth concept. I, I think that's a great one. I'll share the same similar vein of your story. My mom was not clear about her final wishes, whether she wanted to be cremated, which she told a good portion of the population and spread at the beach, or if she wanted to be buried. And so we believe that my mom wanted to be cremated. We cremated her and put her at the beach because that was her favorite spot on earth. So when I want to go talk to my mom, I go to the beach and I get to go talk to my mom. But my aunt, who was certain that my mom wanted to be buried, approached me at her service and said, your mom would roll over in her grave if she knew that you burned her. And I said, well, Aunt Joyce, it's a little late for that. She, she won't have I the mean, opportunity to roll over in that grave. Would, would she no longer have the beach. opportunity to roll over. Right. And, you know, you know, my mom got 16 extra years with a liver transplant and we were at death's doorstep a number of times. So making jokes about some serious, serious things, including how my mom was going to pass away. She had a common cold, which she was pretty close with, with her prediction. But I think when, when you have that perspective, which is really what you're coming back to is what's the perspective that you're going to bring to the world? If you want to see the bad in the world, you can see it. I promise you, you can see it. And if you want to see the good in the world, good news, you can see that too. And so which pair of glasses are you going to bring to your life every single day? And you know, the example I give when we're hiring people are you hiring Buzz Lightyear, the guy who can figure stuff out? Or are you going to hire Eeyore, the one who's going to complain at every single turn? I know who I want around me. I know who I want inside my build, building. And so that's just what I'm thinking about. And so I love that. There's, there's too much time, energy, and, and attention focused on the negativity. And that that's a big underlying concept when I start the book in terms of you know, you go through the litany of you've you've gone through or, or you're still working your way through COVID and what's going on in the Ukraine is is just horrible and homelessness and poverty and addiction. And, you know, you go through the list. And again, I throw in a few stats, not too many, but, you know, there's one study, I think that it was something like 80% of all thoughts are negative. 90% of all media coverage is negative. I mean, come on, Why? Like, why, why do we focus on that? They, I, I am truly on a mission to change that perspective. I, I, I need a lot of people behind me, but I really think we could change the world. And, and, and I don't mean that sort of in a flip it, like, hey, we're going to change the world. And you're like, all right, he's crazy. But why can't we all get off this call? And later today, we're at dinner or we're, we're doing something. And we're like, you know, I, I heard this guy talk today. And like, I don't know why we don't spend more time focus on what's great, what's wonderful, what's awesome, what I'm grateful for, what I'm happy for. Why do we sort of dwell on, oh, this didn't work. And that's like, this is stressing me on this. Blah, blah, blah. Enough with that. Enough. We just don't need it. The, the, the negativity bias is a real, 
It's a real thing, right? We, no question. we will dwell on the things that are negative as opposed to uh, the same impact. We will not celebrate the positive. We'll just take that for granted. That's the way it's supposed to happen. And so, you know, that's our survival instinct for sure. Yep. Um, that, gets, that gets kicked in there, but you're right. It's just a matter of what's your approach going to be and what's the impact that I want to have in the world. And I think if you can get people back into that place of conscious invention, con- constantly bringing people in there, yep. it, it does lift all of us up. And I think that's, you know, that's why I do this show because, you know, my job, I, I point it right there positively impact 5 million people over the next five years through better business. We are always better together, sharing our experiences, thinking about ways in which we can get better. And, you know, the the best advice I ever got was from my brother who loved to party more than he loved to go to college. And so he ended up going into the Navy and we, we shared a room and he gave me the best advice I've ever gotten when I was 12 years old. And that was learn from my mistakes. I made them for you. I was like, oh, shit, I don't have to make my own mistakes. I just have to be highly aware and scan the landscape of life and continue to think about how do I do this better? How do we do this together? And I think that's to your point. Hey, here's what I've learned. Here's what I can see in the world. And doesn't that just make sense? Because you're right. I mean, it's the same thing that I say. People don't show up to work and say, you know what? I really want to suck today. But there's plenty of people who are ineffective because our leaders don't do a great job of setting the tone. Right? Agreed. You have if you have a sad sack as a leader, man, that's going to be a long day every single day. And so that's not someone that I would want to work for or with. Agreed. Agreed. And we all have that power. You know, another thing I talk about in the book is that at some point in our life, we're all leaders. This isn't incumbent upon only our political leaders, our business leaders, our fill in the blank. Uh, people on this call are, are leaders in their home. They're leaders in their religious community. They're leaders in their social networks, whatever it is. It could just be a group of three or four friends, right? It doesn't have to be some massive, you know, I'm the mayor of the town. I could be the mayor of, of the group of three or four. And you have the ability to positively impact and set the tone and and set people in a direction toward positivity in everything that you do. And, and I, and I, I, challenge everyone to do that. Don't look to, well, you know, our, our CEO is miserable and that's, it's a bad tone or our, you know, our politicians are always miserable and that's, it's a bad tone. I'd love to see greater happiness, gratefulness, cooperation amongst political leaders, right? I mean, all we do is talk about and complain about, you know, Republicans, this Democrats, that they want to draw a wider chasm and gap. Why can't we find political leaders that want to work together? that literally want to find a solution that like they would have my support. I, I would love to find someone run on a platform of making America happy, making America grateful, making America enjoy life. Like that's it. Everything else, like there's three sides at least to everything else. Go through the what, what's going on today as we think about the abortion issues, we think about all the, the big issues. There aren't three sides to happiness. Again, I challenge people to say, wow, you know, it, it, it's no one wants to really be that happy. Come on. It's an easy one, but we don't spend enough time, energy and focus on it. And that's what I hope people do. I, I think you're right. By the way, I think Fox did have a series called Pleasure Island. And they they tried to skin that cat of like happiness for everyone, for sure. <laughs> Listen, yeah. if anyone has any questions for Scott, obviously he's thrown down a lot of information. But you can put them in the chat and we're going to continue to talk here for a little bit. If you want to come off mute when we go to Q&A, you can certainly do that. But certainly fun, high energy guys, Scott, this has been super fun. I'm enjoying it. Yeah. So if, you know, I know you have a, another handful of things. What are the ones that are the most important? Because I want to be respectful of, of our time and our guest time and your time as well. Look, it all starts with attitude. Attitude is the is the foundation. You have the ability to control your attitude and those around you. There's no question about it. That's why I start with them. I mean, the other concepts, uh, quickly, uh, I talk about, which we've already talked about, I call it tick, tick, boom. The clock is ticking. How are you going to use your time? Use it wisely. Use it smart. Think about the return on investment of your minutes. Another concept is learning, constantly learning. Are you bettering yourself every way in some way? And by the way, learning is so broadly defined. Learning doesn't necessarily mean an academic discipline. Learning could literally be a hobby, but are you finding ways to to learn, to to get better? And I talk about some some, some things that I've done recently that are just sort of kooky at the point in my life. It's like, 
Why are you doing that? Why not? Why not learn? Why not constantly better yourself? I talk about taking chances. You know, too many people get caught up in risk and fear. Risk and fear are horrible negative words. And and I I talk about spinning them and and I recast them in in the book in terms of think about uh, fear as focusing entirely on alternative responses. Instead of going to the automatic, this scares me and here's the outcome. Maybe there's an alternative to that. I talk about risk and, and resisting the instinct and starting with knowledge, resist that automatic sort of, oh, that's risky. And think about from a knowledge-based approach, how risky is it? What are the outcomes? So, so taking chances and getting it done are another big concept. I talk a lot, can't make it alone. There, there is so much, we live in an interrelated world. The power of community, the power of relationships, the power of family, you know, you and I, Jerry, have both talked extensively about our wives and, and there's nothing more important to me in my life than my wife and my family. And, and, and it may not be your family. It may very well be your friends. For everyone, it's different. This is non-judgmental. But I will definitively say we can't make it alone. We can as, as, as individuals, as humans, as a society, in terms of finding happiness, gratefulness, a fulfilling life, it's never alone. There's, it always, no matter what, it's more fun with others. I talk about passion, about really being committed to something, not just a sort of passing fad, a hobby, but going all in. Whatever it is you choose to do, commit to it in a big way. Make it your, again, passion. I think passion is a a powerful word. And one of my favorite interview questions that always throws people, I love it. I've been asking it and and I've been been in different roles. I've interviewed hundreds, maybe thousands of people over the years is, what are you passionate about? And it's amazing. I'd say 90 plus percent of the time, it it is a follow-up question to me, you know, like, you mean personally, you mean professionally, like, what do you mean by passion? What are you passionate about? It doesn't matter. It could be sports. It could be religion. It could be, it doesn't matter, but be passionate as opposed to, if I say, what is your hobby? Hobby is this level of, of commitment, energy, fun, excitement, happiness, passion is up here. Why not go up here and be passionate about something? And then finally, I wrap it up and and I do want to make sure we leave time for any questions people have in terms of living today. And it's sort of related to a lot of the other concepts, but I really challenge people in the book to think about, and I challenge all your listeners to think about it right now or tonight or, or whenever, what are those few couple of words on that tombstone, assuming you want to be buried? I, I know, Jerry, we talked about not everyone's going to be buried, but if there's an epithet, how do you want to be remembered? And, and now after you've written that down, by the way, I think you should write it down because I think it's important. Take it one level deeper. And, and what are the key messages that you want to be in your eulogy? So now we're talking about your friends and family in the room. These are the people that knew you, loved you. They've, they've actually given up some time in their day to come be here for your funeral. So you must have some impact on them. How do you want them to remember you? And then when you're done with that, I want you to write down what do you want those couple of key concepts to be in your obituary? Because now we're talking about people that have never met you. And how do you want the world to know your existence? What are those key themes? Start with the tombstone, then think about the eulogy, and think about the obituary. And when you have that written out, that's a pretty good idea of what you could or should be doing today in terms of living your best life. Because when you get down that home stretch, you get to the end, it may be too late. And and I talk about another thing is is regrets people have when they're dying and and why have those regrets if you could plan now i love the concept of tombstone eulogy obituary because that's something that everyone leaving here today can go and say huh what really constitutes a life well led my life well led and you know as as my mom was going through one of her operations for lung cancer i wrote about one of the great tragedies of life is that we don't get to write our own legacy. All we can do is leave clues behind. We have to give people the stories. And so if I start with my tombstone and think about my eulogy and my obituary, it is amazing. Yeah, Bill said it, let's talk about reverse planning. Like, well, let's not leave this to chance. Let's live life with intention. If I want people to say this, then what do I need to do? What actions do I need to take to go make that happen? And I think that one's just a really a great a great piece that everyone should write that down. Maybe we'll make that the homework assignment, or Maria make a make a note that we'll put that in the uh, the best places to lead Facebook community group. If you guys haven't joined over there, I would encourage you to come join on Facebook. We have a private community group where we just come and talk about whatever's going on, share ideas, share stories. How do we get better? I think that would be a fun one for uh, maybe our Friday question of the week. 
Good stuff. One of the questions that Alex Poindexter, um, who I met, who has a great attitude and a bright future ahead of him. Alex, I don't know if you want to come off mute and ask this question yourself, or I can ask it for you. But since you're going to be doing a lot of talking in your life, I would encourage you to come off mute. Yeah, so I can ask a question. So basically, I was just wondering for Scott, like, how would you say that like a positive approach and attitude is contagious, like around others, especially that are super negative? Like, do you see that it often spills over into their mindset as well, like especially being a leader? Absolutely. There, there's no question about it. I want you to think about this call right now. So as you hang up, do you feel happier after the call or before the call? I mean, that, that should be the first test that I'd ask people. And I hope I could be wrong, but I hope most people hang up and be like, at least for a few minutes, like, yeah, this is kind of fun. This is exciting. This I'm energized. I'm smiling. I'm grateful. And look, you may revert back to, to someplace else in an hour or two, but I do think uh, positivity is contagious. I do think it helps people. Look, there are certain people that live with a, an extreme negative bias and, and you're never going to change that. Um, I'm hopeful that I can move it a little bit. So if you're, if, if this is the positive end, you know, I'm off the screen here to the right and the negative is way out here. If I get that extreme negative person, they listen to this call and maybe I can move them back a little bit. I'm not going to get them to the positive. It's going to be hard, but if I can, I can make them smile a little bit. I can make them find some happiness. I can make them take away one point. Maybe they leave the call and they're like, yeah, you know, my life still sucks, but they, they, they take Jerry's challenge. They're like, you know what? what would my tombstone say? And then all of a sudden they're like, huh, do I want it to say, hmm, dude was miserable his whole life? Or do I want it to say, I don't know, fill in the blank. So so I, I do think, uh, Alex, it, it is contagious. I do think we, everyone on this phone has the ability to, to impact others. As I said before, we're all leaders in different ways. I, I don't know everyone on the call. Um, I don't know your situation, but there's some situation today, tonight, tomorrow, this weekend, where you'll have the ability to impact others. And I challenge you all to, to find a way to point out that the, the sky is blue, the sun is shining. I'm grateful to be here. I can't believe I have the opportunity to do whatever it is that, that, that you want to do. But you know, even if it's as simple as sitting around with, with a spouse or kids watching TV, right? So, so when you talk about positive urgency, the, the immediate thing is, well, I probably, he's probably saying I shouldn't waste time you know, watching TV or, or whatever it is. You fill in the blank. And I'm not saying that at all. Actually, exactly the opposite. If that's important to you and you proactively think about it and you're deliberate and you choose to watch TV, then sit there and be like, wow, it's amazing that I have this fill in the blank. I don't know, 46, 62, 75 inch TV. I, I, it doesn't really matter. It could be 28 inch black and white, but I have this and I have the ability to spend time with people I love sitting next to me watching and enjoying this show and, and creating memories for my kids and my family, whatever it is, so that years from now, they'll be like, remember that goofy sitcom that we all watch together? That's the ability to infectiously, positively affect those around you. Awesome. Thank, Thank you for your insight. I think you're a hundred percent right, Scott. And, you know, Alex, to, to your point, because I know who you get to work with, um, who's Matt Fox, all one of the most, uh, inspiring visionary leaders, um, that guy doesn't get down, right? I mean, he is rah, rah, rah. It is impossible to be down around Matt Foxhall. And so I, I get the same sense that it's impossible to be down around Scott White as well. Um, last call, if anyone has any questions, you can come off mute and just ask your question. Um, otherwise, I'm gonna say to uh, Scott that we are so grateful for you coming and, and sharing your wisdom and your knowledge and your experience. Um, it has been super fun because this is a philosophy that I personally identify with. You know, I was interviewed, um, geez, it was probably about a year ago. And, you know, the guy was talking about um, the whole notion of like um, fear of failure. I said, you know what? You know, what's greater than that for me being 75 and laying on a hospital gurney and thinking I had chances to make an impact and I chose not to take a risk. And that to me is way scarier than the potential of quote unquote failing, which is only just learning. And so um, I'm going to live life full out and we're going to go make as much fun and impact and happiness as we possibly can make because we just choose to do that every single possible day. Yeah, look, one of the, I mean, that's a great last point or, or toward the end here, Jerry, that you bring up. One of the things I talk about is um, uh, Ronnie Ware is a uh, hospice palliative care nurse in Australia who wrote a book, uh, a wonderful book, top 
regrets of the dying. I forget exactly what's called. It doesn't matter. But but the the key point is the point you just made is that uh, she interviewed people on their deathbeds and you know they went through their five top regrets and more than anything it's what they didn't do it's not what they did it's not the mistake they made it's that what they didn't do so I hope as people listen to this they hop off and it doesn't have to be world changing that's what's I think important is 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 you don't have to go out today and and go do some massive deal go buy some company to you could literally decide you know what I've always wanted to fill in the blank hobby uh call somebody create a relationship be a friend whatever it is do it today why wait for tomorrow I, I you know people are in different time zones but on the east coast here it's 4 30 there's plenty of daylight get off the call and go do something fun I love it Great, great stuff, Scott. Everyone else, thank you so much for coming. Next week, we have uh, Megan Bowen, the COO of Refine Labs. Uh, over the course of the last two years, they have built a company, a $100 million annual recovering revenue company, 125 people, literally from four people to 125 in two years. Um, and uh, I've spoken about Chris Walker before. I think he's the smartest, one of the top three smartest marketers and she is the sidekick that is operationalizing his business. She's going to be talking about culture, and um, it is she's amazing. So it's going to be super fun to uh, to speak with her. And again, if you have not joined us on the Best Places to Lead Facebook group, I didn't invite you to go do that. And if not, we will see you next week for Megan Bowen. I hope you guys have a great uh, great Thursday. Thank you so much for coming. And Take Scott, care. thank you. Bye bye.